Viewpoint, weekdays, 8 to 10 p.m. on SAFM. The Viewpoint. Weekdays, 8 to 10 p.m. Songhez on The Viewpoint. It's The Viewpoint here on SAFM, leading the conversation with your host, Songa Zomapek. The first hour has come, first hour has gone. Most recently, we had Mr. Fananaya Mondli Kulu, a currently unemployed graduate, honors in development studies from the University of Zululand, telling us about his journey to where he is right now, talking also to us about why he decided to wear reflective jacket boots and an overall donated by a local farmer to his graduation, telling us and lamenting quite emotionally at that, the fact that his parents are not there to witness such a grand occasion for him in terms of the triumph he has had to overcome in his very short life of 23 years before him. Professor Eugene Clutie of Stellenbosch University, he is the current DVC Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies, giving us an account as to the response Stellenbosch to date has conducted following the aftermath and the fallout really with the community of South Africa, in particular that community that identifies as coloured following the age and education related effects of cognitive functioning in coloured South African women studies conducted by Professor Elmarita Blanche as well as her colleagues. Many things are happening at Stellenbosch and we will follow that story and certainly if anything is worthy of more discussion, SAFM leading the conversation with myself, Songa Zomapetla will follow up on that. Second hour now, African hour African Narrative Hour 2107. We are in conversation with Professor Simpiwe Sesanti, Institute for African Renaissance here at the University of UNISA. Probably a good time to talk about African Renaissance. It's Africa Month. Professor Sesanti, Mkhega Zom, Mkhega Gunjani. Mkhega Zom, Mkhega Sipiwe, Lako, and good evening to all the listeners of the SFM. Zlande, Mkhega, Zika Vosu, Zifrele, Apo, Zikho, Yozako. Kawa Vosu, Kawa Vosu. Thank you so much for identifying yourself in a true African way. Professor, before we talk about anything else, I just want to ask this question. Why is a conference organized in Africa Month still asking a question like, is pan-Africanism in the 21st century even relevant? What kind of question is that? It is a very important question um, uh, in a contextual sense Um, because, um, you know, in the general conversation or discourse, um, pan-Africanism as an ideological framework um, is occupying a space that is in the margin. In other words, you know, there's a lot that is rhetorical but um, and little that uh, that is practical. Now, if you interrogate, um, for instance, in South Africa here, we hear um, that uh, you know uh, many people of um, African descent um, who are coming from um, other countries are being persecuted, you know, by their own people who are coming from within South Africa. And so the question then is, um, if there is this absence of um, you know Pan African consciousness this pan-African solidarity, then that kind of question arises because, you know, um, here we are, um, the, the, the African people themselves um, view one another as foreigners. The question is, how do you regard uh, an African in Africa as a foreigner? So if you have that kind of uh, discourse, if you have that kind of, uh, you know, a reference to, to one another, then it tells you, that, um, you know, uh, there's a long way for us to go. But everything turns on framing. And I just want to quickly get this out of the way before I actually introduce the nature of this discussion. Everything turns on framing. Why, for instance, notwithstanding what you have said, you can still achieve those outcomes. You can still engage in that context by possibly, for instance, saying, modernizing pan-Africanism to respond to the challenges of Africa in the 21st century, to ask is it even relevant almost calls into question our own existence. And no one else is asking this question but ourselves. <laughs> That's a very good one, um, because the truth of the matter is, you know, your, your, your kind of framing is, um, is, quite, is quite important 
because as you say, um, you know, um, uh, suggesting or questioning otherwise seems to be suggesting that um, you're even doubting the very relevance um, of the concept, but not necessarily. As I said earlier on, in 1998, 21 years from now, there was an, an African Renaissance conference that was held in Johannesburg. Some of the, uh, among the issues that were discussed at the conference, you know, was um, that, uh, you know, the, the people of this uh, part of the world, that is South Africa, whenever they are referring um, to, to the rest of the African continent, they speak about Africa as if um, South Africa is not part um, of, the, of, the, of the African continent. So the question, um, more than questioning the relevance of Pan-Africanism, is a basically a rhetoric or rhetorical question that um, is aimed at, um, at sensitizing and, prov- and being provocative, as it were, about the, this, this importance um, of this concept, uh, Pan-Africanism. We're in conversation with Professor Simpiwe Sasanti, who is at UNISA at the Institute for African Renaissance. Currently taking place starting tomorrow is the African Unity for Renaissance Conference. It's a two-day conference that will focus on identifying key current governance, peace and security and sustainable development challenges and opportunities. Also talking about the Continental Free Trade Agreement and the ways in which an innovative pan-African approach can effectively contribute to moving agenda forward. The conference will scrutinize something I have an issue with, the relevance of pan-Africanism in the 21st century, <laughs> and there's no better person to talk to us about that than Uztonga's to Let's talk about the substantive issues now. Very rec- I mean, you just mentioned the fact that South Africa's relationship with Africa is such that there's a South Africa and there's the rest of Africa. And we'll get into the issues as it pertains to that. But this is true because in 2013, around about October, President Zuma mentioned something along these lines. This is not somewhere in Africa. This is Johannesburg. We're not talking about some road in Malawi. This was the government's response to the Etol saga that was gripping the Johannesburg metro at the time. That is right. Why do we as South Africans seem to have this relationship with our fellow continent brothers and sisters? Well, that's a very good one. Let's begin here and, and, and begin, you know, with the with the with the former president um, Jacob Zuma, um, who made that kind of an utterance in that year, um, an utterance that was then, um, you know, received with anger, rightly so, by the by the by the rest of the African continent. Um, you would recall that um, the, the former president himself, when they were, there was a tug of war within the ANC for, for the presidency, um, you know, uh, referred to himself as a proud Zulu, right? Um, proudly Zulu or, or something like that. Um, and subsequently to that, um, it, is, it is on record, you read the book by Vusima Vimbel, um, time is not the measure. Recently, a few a few weeks ago, um, uh, in Mangosutu leader, uh, I mean, IFP leader Mangosutu was well saying that uh, in KwaZulu Natal, there was a swing towards the African National Congress because there was a perception that uh, the, the perceived historically cross dominated ANC was now being ruled by a Zulu speaking person. So that gives you a very clear sense. Um, of the parochial politics um, of uh, the former president, uh, Jacob Zuma, so that the kind of statement then that he made um, came as no surprise um, because he's got, you know, a deep ethnic consciousness as opposed to uh, an African nationalist consciousness that informed the very foundation of the African National Congress. So therefore, you know, we need to link these dots and see this, but then, and that this is the tragedy of the matter about about South African politics. That after we had, you know, um, Stephen Bantubiko, who advanced the unity of black people in this country across ethnicities. After we had the the president of the Pan Africanist Congress of Tanzania, Mangali Sosobuko, who advanced African nationalism and Pan Africanism. After we had earlier than that, um, Zwake Anton Limbede. Um, the first president of the ANC Youth League, who advanced a very progressive African nationalism. This day and age, after so many years, we have this deep sense of ethnic consciousness 
um, where people perceive themselves as Amatosa, who perceive themselves as Amazulu, who perceive themselves as Amavenda, and that type of a thing, uh, people relating to one another in that way within, I mean, within organizations that are supposed to be taking us forward. So then, going back to what to the discomfort um, that you have with the rhetorical question that is being posed, that is where we are. Um, that uh, we have taken one step forward and taken three steps backward. We'll talk about this ethnicity thing a little bit deeper because it does merit further attention. You know, sometime in 2016, and as you were talking, it took me back to that as you were referring to President Zuma. First of all, being deeply ethnic without more is not in and of itself offensive, in my view, because this is why it simply is a confirmation of your identity at its core. But that does not necessarily make it offensive to somebody who doesn't identify as you. Is that correct? You, you're making a very good point. Professor Kosekwa Pra wrote, um, you know, an, a very interesting book, uh, The African Nation, The State of the Nation. Mm. Now, this book, Professor Kosekwa Pra, earlier on, when we began, you you asked me to identify myself um, on, the basis of, on the basis of my clan association. Sure. And now, for some, um, this can be perceived as it is not being cleanliness. Rather, you know, it is important that as African people, we must celebrate, um, you know, our ethnicity, uh, speaking Isitosa or speaking Isizuru or speaking Sitswana. And there is no contradiction in that. The problem is when one, um, you know, begins to think that one's ethnic group is superior to the other. When one begins to think that um, one's language um, is better than the other as African people. So celebrating the South, uh, there's nothing wrong. But when you begin to use that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that ethnic consciousness as a tool to begin to undermine African unity and to advance parochial and selfish interests, that is where the problem, I mean, the, the problem arises. Um, you know, when, when, uh, when Czech Hunter Diop, for instance, one of the greatest pan Africanists um, who has lived, said that um, in order for us as African people to advance the concept of the African Renaissance, we need to revisit the importance um, of advancing our African languages. Now, um, Walter Rodney came in and said that this should never be mistaken. Um, as, uh, as valorizing um, one African language and vilifying the other, because the chance um, always exists that uh, those who um, want to use ethnic identities uh, to advance their own selfish interests can mm. always, always elevate uh, Tosaism, Zuluism, uh, Tsonaism, Sutuism at the expense of Africanism. So therefore, you know, the, the point then that is being raised is that uh, when we address and approach these issues, we need to do so with a great sense of caution and sensitivity. Otherwise, um, you know, the, the entire project can go haywire. Achi Mafedja, the African anthropologist of the 60s, better known as the Dean of Tribalism. You've got Utatubiko in the 70s talking about black consciousness and infused in that is the pride in who we are, but not at the expense of other human beings. Black consciousness, even Professor Bani Pityana speaks about it through his teachings. Where have we as an African nation swayed from the underpinnings that were the basis of Ubuntu that gave us this collective strength? What happened? What really happened to, to begin with, um, you know, with the advent of um, colonialism and the imperialism, um, what happened is that, um, you know, there's a saying, when poverty enters, love flies through the window. Um, um, when people are under pressure, the instinct is always to preserve and to protect, you know, themselves as individuals, as opposed um, on a solidarity and group basis. So then, this is what happened um, to the African people. They were beaten into submission, and they were beaten into a state of amnesia. And this amnesia is very important because what then happened when they were dispossessed is that, um, you know, due to hunger, poverty, and all that, individualism set in. And then, you know, each and everyone looked out for themselves. And so in the process as well, you know, what then happened was that 
Not only did people begin to, to, to have disdain for their values, but you would hear many, many African people saying that um, we are where we are today because of our sense of generosity, because of our sense of Ubuntu. We, we allowed and welcomed uh, um, aggressive forces into the continent and look where we are. Our generosity has not benefited us in any way. So then, then um, when people are in that kind of a condition, they begin to say that uh, this Ubuntu business has not worked for us, rather it has worked to our disadvantage. So they begin to have tendencies of selfishness, um, you know, towards the goal of of preservation, of self-preservation, and what they think is success. And, um, you know, what what went then along with that was not just, you know, the the, the content for, for our own values, but the content for our very own selves. Anything that is associated with Africanness began to be subjected um, uh, to scrutiny and question. And anything and everything um, that seems to be succeeding, um, that is associated with the, with the values um, of the European world and others, um, began to be seen as uh, something that is viable. And so then, um, in, in summing up the, 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 the answer to the question that you were raising, where did we go wrong? We mm. went wrong at that point. And it is at that point that uh, philosophers, you know, such as um, Nkirunze, Gu of Nigeria, and Ngugi Wationgo um, mm. of Ghana, mm. um, begin to tell us um, that, uh, you know, um, our, our first step, uh, which, is, which is very crucial, is that we must rediscover our sense of culture. Because I remember you hearing earlier on speaking about the question of economics, and we tend to, em- to have to emphasize this because they are material. But, you know, I'm one of those who share the view that um, we, we, can, we can be free materially. We can be free in other ways, but for as long as we, do not, we are not free um, culturally as a people, we will not go very far because we are operating in the cultural frameworks of others, such that even then that economic freedom becomes meaningless because it reduces us to being consumers um, and, 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 and does not you know, take us back um, to, the, to, the, to the cultural values that made our, our ancestors the great people that they were. I'm interested in engaging culture. I'm interested in engaging this thing that you say needs to be almost foundational to our collective success and having a proper pan-African outlook to which we can all find purchase and expression as the African people. And I say this because I want, please, now, if ever I've made a plea before, it is now. 891 please. I'm asking for those who identify with the culture, movement, language of Africans. What do Africans speakers and those who identify with the culture that defines Africans and Afrikaners have to say about Pan-Africanism? Where is the expression in Africa? How is Africa to them who they find expression in? If at all, I'm appealing now for the next 20 or so minutes. I'm appealing to the Africans community. I don't want to have a discussion of you, about you, Without you, we have on in studio. I beg your pardon. We have on the line Professor Simpiwa Sasanti, who's at the Institute for African Renaissance at the University of South Africa. Whilst we are waiting for the Africans community to come through, let's have a discussion, please, about the legacy of President Tabombeki, particularly as it pertains to African Renaissance, because this, especially on 8 May 1996, if ever it had been in doubt before, it certainly wasn't post that speech. Well, um, President Tabombeki has played a pivotal and great role um, in, um, in, in resuscitating the, the discussion about, about uh, the African Renaissance um, in, the, in, the, in South Africa in particular, and, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, throughout the African continent as well. Um, let us begin by saying that <clears throat> one of the greatest things um, that uh, if we examine the very speech uh, that, uh, you know, former President Tabombeki made um, in 1996, he began with the open wing words, I am an African. Mm. Now, those exact words, and I remember, you know, with fascination reading Vusma Vimbela's book, Time is Not the Measure, um, he says that, uh, he traces this, um, you know, he says that President Beki, before that day, he began to have conversations with him and said that we need to begin from the beginning. 
And so if we interrogate that, um, we begin to realize that, um, you know, exactly 90, 90 years um, um, before Mbeki made that statement in 1996, uh, Big Slicker Isaka Feme in 1906 had delivered uh, um, a speech that won him an award in 1906 um, when he was a student in the USA. And he said, I'm an African. So therefore, you know, there are many who tend to criticize um, uh, former President Becky um, and saying that he has made a claim that uh, he was the originator of the African Renaissance concept. And Becky has never done that. Um, when we examine his, his writings, he does state explicitly that uh, the African Renaissance idea is far older than him, you know, um, and says that the only difference with South Africa is that now there was an opportunity to begin to implement, and it's quite, in, it's quite correct um, in saying that because, uh, you know, um, if I, I look at the, at the writings about the African Renaissance, 1897, if I remember well, Martin Delany, you know, began to speak about regeneration. And after him, it was Kai Sakafeme who began to speak about, um, mm. you know, mm. uh, uh, regeneration, followed by uh, Nan Namdi Azikiwe, who spoke about the Renaissance African, followed by Chekh Anta Diop, who spoke about the African Renaissance proper um, in the year 1946. 48, no, 48, and followed by uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who wrote his book, um, you know, um, uh, The Consciousism, in 1964. So you see that um, in, uh, in the true sense um, of the word, the African Renaissance concept is a pan-Africanist project um, that is not uh, or, um, um, uh, exclusively, and, uh, you know, that should be reduced to South Africa. It is a pan-African concept. And so, you know, President Becky then, um, help us uh, to to revive, and and for me the um, you know strategic position being the president of South Africa, and uh, the president of the ANC then um, began to say that we we need to revisit this concept and advance it because without reclaiming ourselves, without rebuffing our own values, um, without regenerating our our revolutionary consciousness. Um, we cannot be able to advance forward. So, um, uh, briefly then, and in sum, this is the, the major contribution that uh, President Becky, you know, played in the in the African Renaissance uh, project. And it clearly is him because he hasn't let up since he left and vacated the office of the presidency because he's running Timali, the Tabombeki African Leadership Institute at your university, UNISA, for which he's now the chancellor. So this is clearly something that is him. You, you cannot divorce and or separate Tabombeki to African Renaissance. Yes. Precisely. Notwithstanding what the criticisms are. I mean, I don't understand why there would be a criticism because in some he's advancing a notion that we should all be taking up. Absolutely. You know, um, but then, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that, oh, let me, let me quickly respond to the question that you were raising. Um, the, the beauty about this thing um, with President Beggy uh, clearly, clearly indicates, you know, that uh, one does not have uh, to be actively involved in a political party. One does not have um, to be involved in government um, to advance the African Renaissance. Con- the African Renaissance. In fact, you know, as one um, or other thinker was saying, that uh, the, the major task and the major challenge that confronts us um, in both in reference to Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance is to take the African Renaissance concept beyond, you know, um, the, the, the what is perceived to be an elitist project. The, the, the reason that within the mess that we are in, um, we're having Africans at one another's throats, we're having a lack of appreciation of Africans for one another, is that, uh, you know, to a very great extent, unfortunately, the African Renaissance concept and Pan-Africanism has been, um, you know, uh, imprisoned and caged um, um, at, at an elite level as opposed to being made the, the, um, the project of the African uh, masses in, in general. Because it is only when Pan-Africanism and the African Renaissance notion um, is owned by the African masses um, that the African people will begin to appreciate the importance of this concept and recognize that as Africans, you know, we need one another. That as Africans, we have a common pain, we have a common frustration, we have a common struggle. And that, in fact, 
by mm. tearing one another apart. Um, we are not going to go anywhere other than, you know, dissipating our own energies um, and, and undermining sure. and ultimately being reduced to nothing. We're in conversation with Professor Simpiwe Sasanti at the Institute for African Renaissance at the University of South Africa, UNISA, here in Pretoria. Our line is open 891 Mario, please stay on the line. We have to take a quick ad break before we take it to the home stretch. Stay tuned. The business landscape is changing. Is your business ahead of the curve? Join us on the 23rd and 24th of May for our live broadcast from the 2019 Africa Shared Value Summit in Nairobi, Kenya, where we'll be engaging with some of the world's brightest business minds on how businesses can create both economic value and value for society. Tune in for all this and more. The summit is proudly sponsored by Safaricom, Old Mutual, NL, APSA, the World Food Program, JC Deco, and the Shared Value Africa Initiative. Learn more at AfricaSharedValueSummit.com. The SABC News mobile app is your one-stop digital portal to all the news you need. Stay connected with the latest in breaking news. Watch the SABC News channel along with clips and live streams of all the big news events. And listen to all the SABC News radio stations live, including podcasts and much more. Simply download the SABC News app to your Android or iOS device from either the Play Store or the App Store. SABC News, independent impartial join the party on top billing this saturday evening at six with kelly kumalo and chad the don talking rap ink and romance from roots in gospel to fame through opera nozuko teto returns to grow a new generation of stars and we bring you the home built for a summer that lasts 10 months a year that's top billing this saturday repeat midday sunday on sabc3 The Viewpoint, 8 to 10 p.m. Flipping conventional wisdom on its head. Songe Zomabete on The Viewpoint. That's right. The relevance of Pan-Africanism in the 21st century. We're taking your calls on 891 The plea has been and still is for the next 10 minutes, please. Can we try and focus the balance of this conversation? It's only 11 minutes remaining of this conversation. To Pan-Africanism, Africa and the culture of Africans. I want to engage this community. They enjoy purchase and traction in this country for a history most Afrikaners, I understand, probably don't want to be proud of or are not proud of. But nonetheless, we are in 2019. We are building a nation. We are building a continent based on values of Ubuntu. And I want contributions from those who are in the Africans community, who identify as Afrikaners and have their perspectives on Pan-Africanism. We're taking your calls on 891 Contributions have come through so far. We need to activate our values of collective consciousness and social awareness and add values to our social well-being. Ubuntu, Ubuntu, meaning values of collective consciousness and social awareness. Thank you so much, Maishe Bopape. Khadebe Kamo, that is, says, not that love flies out of the window. Rather, compatibility is not met at certain time. No one wants to starve, hence they will look elsewhere where they are provided for. Love does not feed, unfortunately. Working and earning does that. Thank you, Khadebe. And calling us from the capital, Ndrungulu, Tswane, Mario. Hello, Mario. Hi, hi. When, Indeed. I think that pan Africanism and uh, nationalism and this type of things have become lost in this new era of selfishness and greed and monetarism. You know, it's almost like people are, uh, everyone's got a price these days, 150 years back, very little people had a price. But um, I, I want to represent or give my views about Afrikaners because half my family is not totally right in Afrikaans. And the other of my family is not the right wing of the front, but they're still conservative. But sure. the, the right wing are ones, when they uh, handed over, uh, let's say, power basically in, in 94, they, they were still them. They were still ethnic nationalists. And um, whatever goes with ethnic nationalism, tribalism, their heart is in this country. They see themselves as part of this country, part of this continent. I personally see myself as an African, well, I know myself as an African that left here 45,000 years ago and mixed it in the Andrews and came all the way back. So to me, that's where I am. But the general Afrikaner, they're not all the same. But mm. the fur trackers and the real Afrikaners, these guys want tribal land. These guys want 
they'll even take the Northern Cape or part of the Northern Cape where there's nothing because they want to be part of this land. They, they're like the Israelis. They've got a pact with God and the blood of the thing. And this is where they are. This is where their hearts are. This is where their minds are. They are being forced to give up some of their culture and, and, and a lot of their things that they, they tried and met to, 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 and their whole way of thinking to adapt to the new way of life. But they are doing it very difficultly. It's very difficult to change. We all know how difficult to change. But their hearts are here. And to me, um, the thing that holds this country back is, is to just get the, the land issue on a track where it cannot be thwarted and, and taken away in a Mugabe style and to get confidence to the business people, to get jobs employed and to get the country started again and not listen to promises and lies of people like Helen and these things and dreams and things that are not working. Good or practical. If economists are practical, they make things work, they get along with their people, they work, they have the ethnicity, yes, but their hearts are yeah, and their minds are, are, are over the people of Africa. Can I indulge you, Mario, now that you're on the line? You say yeah, they yeah. get along with their people. What do you mean by that? Just define people, their people? They've got... Uh, Who is their people is my question. Right-wingers, the right-wingers, they're ethnic, right? So, so they're white in the first place. They identify with whiteness. They identify with their genetical string of whiteness where a Zulu would identify with Zuluness or whatever. You know, whoever's ethnic, if you an ethnic person, you, you, you just have that ethnic thing about you. If you're Indian or you're Chinese or whatever you are, you are ethnic. So I'd say about maybe almost two-thirds of white people are ethnic. It doesn't matter if they're Afrikaners or they're German or they whatever they are. They're ethnic nationalists representing their countries, wherever they are. If their daughters or whatever mix with them, they don't mind. A lot of them don't mind. But the right wingers do, because the right wingers are religiously. So you must know their whole belief system is different to ours. We're more democratic, we're more open minded. But the, the, the traditionalists, it's difficult to try to change tradition. And we can't expect in 25 years to force people that we knew were right wingers, they were extreme right wing extremists in 1994. We can't expect them all to change overnight. And we have to. We, we are fighting a uh, lot of racism thing. There's a law against racism now. Now it's a land issue. Those are our two big things. And now when we've conquered, we've conquered racism, we've conquered uh, 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 land issue, it's been nice for us all the way, my man. Investment, happiness, job, and that's, that's the way we go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that call there, Moria. Mr. Ndlovo from Emma Lakleni, you want to contribute? Yeah, how are you? How are you? Uh, well, thank I, you. I how about you? Yeah, I, I want the professor to comment about it. Sure. Actually, me, I, I, I'm a stronger speaking. Uh, those who they call uh, Amashanga. So, actually, I'm. Baba, the peril. Yeah, the peril. Yeah. In Chan. Ah, I forget. And I can't go. Yeah. Actually, I, I'm always, most of the time, I'm always worried. Yeah. Because we we are the minority here in South Africa, and uh, we got a, a lot of tribalism. So most of the people do don't know uh, our history, actual uh, uh, African history. So like we, the Shangan speaking, we, we actually we originate from uh, uh, from the the Zide, Zide, Zide uh, from the Twande tribes. So, but yeah, we got uh, in South Africa, we got tribalism. So, uh, uh, maybe it's not uh, it's not for the first time here yeah, that most of the people here in South Africa, when they see those who are from uh, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, the outsiders, those who are in, those who are not South African, they always call them the Shangans and all those things. So. I wonder whether we are going to achieve uh, this African renaissance with the lot of tribalism we have here. So Thank you so much, you President Lovu. I'm yeah, sure okay. Professor has got something to say about that and the previous caller, Moria's comments. Professor Sasanti? Thank you, very much. Very quickly, um, I, I had the first gentleman uh, that was raising all the issues that um, he, he was raising. Um, and then, um, you know, I can understand um, the, the, the points that he was making about the anxieties and all that. Um, that uh, you know uh, associated um, with with minority group, minority groups, and my my quick response is that you know what has happened. Um, a strange thing that has happened in the history of the liberation movement 
uh, both on the part of those who are regarded as white and on the part of those who are regarded as black, um, there's always been concerned about to protect and to be sensitive um, to, to, the, to the interests of the people who have been advantaged, and in this case, um, the white people, and, list, and little uh, sensitivity that, that has been made. So um, the, my point is, quite correctly, our leaders have done this, um, because they could understand that, um, you know, the, the, the white minority groups had a sense of anxiety. But equally so, um, the, the anxiety that has gripped uh, the majority of, the, of those who were oppressed and who had been disadvantaged and dispossessed, you know, needs to be seriously taken into cognizance. And I think that this has not happened, and this is why we are in the mess that we are in, because to a very great extent, our leaders correctly have, you know, advanced the notion of reconciliation, and there was less that was spoken about the question of justice. Um, and so those that uh, were disadvantaged yesterday continue to be disadvantaged, and that is why they are caring at one another. And to, to this gentleman um, that has just uh, spoken now, um, uh, speaking to Tonga, or what is referred to as Shangan, and I spoke in his language because I'm trying very much uh, to learn that language, uh, that mm. speaking, very beautiful language. And this is a teaching um, of Pan-Africanism that, um, for whatever reason, perhaps, um, you know, internal sectors and also external sectors, we have been a people that have been a support, but the, the, the advance, yes, it is going to happen. Uh, it must happen. We owe it to ourselves as African people. You must understand that uh, Tsonga is, is a language, Sikosa is a language, but above that is our Africanness. We are one people. For instance, you know, just now when I was talking to him, he says, Minjani, and I would say in my language, it's Minjani, and Yonati, Mikona, Nikona, and I would say in my language, Nikona, and Yonati, Nakensangov, thank, uh, uh, thank you very much, and then like a cool. So mm. there is mm. much that is common amongst us. There is a lot that unites us, and, um, you know, there is little that, uh, that sets us apart. In fact, it's not so much even a difference, as Professor Pitikam Tolu would say, it's just variation not even differences. So, yes, um, it is possible that uh, we, we will be one people, and not only is it possible, it is a, a necessity. We owe it to ourselves as African people. We certainly do. We certainly do, and we thank you for your contributions. And unfortunately, we haven't had time to even talk about some of the con- conversations that will, taking, that will be taking place tomorrow about the Continental Free Trade Agreement and how the <laughs> economic emancipation of Africans can assist in driving a pan-Africanist agenda. Final comments from me. Tomorrow at 10.20, Professor Simpiwe Sasante, whose voice for the majority of time you've been hearing, will be part of a panel facilitated by Ms. Crystal Orderson, Together with, on the panel, Professor Lungsi Lenzebeza, Dr. Kojo Opoku Aidu, himself, Professor Sasanti, Ms. Leipelo Lebuhang Peko, as well as Professor Mamo Muchia. They'll be discussing Pan-Africanism for the 21st century. This is the conference taking place tomorrow. African Unity for Renaissance Conference 2019, taking place at Kivitz Kruen in Raya Road in Camille Drift, West Pretoria. That's tomorrow and Thursday, culminating on Africa Day celebrations tomorrow. Professor, all the best, and thank you so much for your contributions. Do you have anything to say, finally, in 30 seconds? Hulebo Haruna, as Kwame Nkrumah said, you know, uh, Ghana without the independence of the African continent was meaningless. And if we were to put it in South Africa and say that, um, the, liberty, the, the freedom that is enjoyed by the South Africans, unless and until it is enjoyed by the other African people, it will be meaningless. Thank you very much. See you later. Tamaku, mazene tole, nanga amso, wenjenje, nagwezinye, izizwe, nengtanga. Professor Simpiwa Sassanti, it's time now for the paper, but before that, it is a quick ad break.